Let's pray as we open the scriptures this morning. Father in heaven, we thank you again for the day and we thank you now for a time of quietness with your word open before us. There are people in our in different countries around the world that don't have the same freedom where churches are illegal. Uh, the word of God is prohibited. Uh, Lord, to own a Bible and to preach from it would invite persecution. And I pray that as we enjoy liberty this morning, we might not take that lightly or for granted. And that we might make the most of what you've blessed us with today. Uh, comfort and relative quiet and time to turn our thoughts towards you through your word. And I pray that you might use this time. You might hide me as the vessel um, entirely behind the cross and that we might be encouraged as we shore up the foundation of our faith and as we clear up some doctrinal issues. I do pray that it might not simply be head knowledge today but that it might transform us as we we are reminded today what it is to rest in our Saviour and his finished work on the cross of Calvary. To know that it is done, and it has been done by our Saviour, that he cried, it is finished and there is no more. I pray that you might take the time and take the word this morning and bless as only you can. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've been working our way through a series which we continue today on soteriology, but more particularly in recent weeks on eternal security. And we've been considering some of the verses which are commonly used to oppose the, the doctrine of eternal security. Verses that often come up when people say things like, yeah, eternal security sounds really good and I understand the verses that talk about grace, but what about these, these tricky verses? What does it mean when it says this? And oftentimes people can tie us up in knots. We can even tie ourselves up in knots just with confusion. We can, we can get to a verse we don't understand and find ourselves worrying about things that we ought not worry. God wants all men to be saved. You would agree with that? He says so. Does he want all men to know they're saved? I believe he does. And not to wonder. Does he give assurance to believers? I think so. He wants us to know that we're saved. And I believe part of the blessing of knowing you're saved and enjoying that assurance is not what, it, not the life of licentiousness that people imply that it will, will lead to, but rather a place of comfort, safety and growth. It is a productive place to be resting in the Saviour to be abiding in the vine, to be um, allowing the, the Spirit to bear the fruit of the Spirit in our life by His grace working in us. That is a, a wonderful place to rest. And it is a place of incredible and miraculous growth. Now, but if you talk to someone and they think that they can lose their salvation, they therefore believe you have to do something to keep it. And in doing that, they've added a requirement of works to a salvation by grace message. Now, that may not be clear in the minds of some people, but the moment you say, in order to keep your salvation, you need to do X, Y, Z, you've added to save by grace alone through faith, alone in Christ alone. You've added something extra. Um, it becomes a works issue. And then a works-based plan or system of achieving acceptance before God is something that people adhere to. Now, it can be the lost people who think they've got to be good in order to get saved could be a Christian who is genuinely saved by grace through faith, who struggles and wrestles with this idea that they are complete in Christ and they feel like they have to work and work and work in order to maintain their salvation. And we've considered many verses here um, and some, some of the arguments which I believe present a biblical basis for the doctrine of eternal security, which we hold to as a church here at Springwood. That, that's what the church believes. Um, we hold to the eternal security of the believer. Um, but we still must acknowledge that there are some, some verses which can confuse people and that's why we're taking the time to do this. We've had a look in the previous weeks at the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit and tried to answer in the context what that was all about. We've spent some time looking at what it is to endure to the end to be saved from Matthew 24. You remember that from last week? Um, and that was talking not about the end of your life and being faithful in, you know, trusting the Lord all the days of your life to the end in order to be saved. It's talking about the end of the tribulation in the context of Matthew 24. If you don't remember that, that's okay. You can listen to a message. You... We also talked about what it is to abide in, in Christ or abide in the vine. Um, and 
And people might say, oh, okay, 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 I accept those arguments, but what about, what if you fall from grace? Have you ever heard that? Have you ever said, oh, you better be careful, brother, you might fall from grace? Have you ever heard it said that way? Well, where they get that from is Galatians, and that's where I'd like you to be today, Galatians chapter 5. And the verse that they use is Galatians 5 verse 4, where the Word of God says, Christ has become of no effect unto you, Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Well, that sounds serious, doesn't it? It is. <laughs> it's, it's a warning. But we need to understand what that warning is and how it fits in the context and the content, compare it with Scripture to form a conclusion. You see a cycle that we're going through here when we come across these difficult verses? Context, content, compare, conclude. We're doing the same thing again. Maybe we won't spend as much time today because I want to jump down to the end of chapter 5 and look at some other tricky verses there as well. So we'll see how we go for time today. But the first thing we look at is the context and what is the book of Galatians all about? The book of Galatians is written to believers who were scattered about the region of Galatia in different churches and he's writing to them to give a defense of the gospel of grace. The book of Romans proclaims the gospel of grace, the book of Galatians defends the gospel of grace because there were those attacking it. So Paul has to defend the truth and then he, then he explains it and then he applies it. If you want a, a quick overview of the book of Galatians, it's the defense of the gospel of grace, the explanation of the gospel of grace and the application of the gospel of grace. And you'll see how that works as you read your way through. Romans, Paul explains it justification by faith. Galatians, Paul defends it. Why does he need to defend it? Because there were people attacking it. There were people twisting it. And they were coming into the church amongst believers and saying, yes, I heard what Paul said and I agree, it's good. You need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be saved. They, they weren't denying that aspect or, or that foundation of the gospel, but they were twisting it by adding something extra. Saying, yes, it's, it's, yes, Paul is right. Christ died for your sins and rose again. Amen. Praise God, that's true. You do need to place your faith in him. But did Paul tell you you need to keep the law of God too? And people go, oh, no, he, he didn't make that clear. So there are people subverting justification by faith. And Paul says in Galatians 1, that's another gospel. All right? And he said, those who preach another gospel are an anathema. All right. He speaks very strongly about those that will preach a different gospel. He says that this is a, a, a gospel that violates grace and it flies right in the face of what Jesus Christ did on the cross because once you add extra requirements to what it is to be justified by God and later as he applies this truth to be sanctified as a believer, you're missing the grace principle. You are opposing what Christ is doing by your legalistic efforts. This is the false teaching that he is tackling in the book. But what's the specific context? Let's have a look in chapter 5, verse 1. He says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty, we might even interpret that or add to our mind here, in the grace, all right? This is the, the grace principle, in the freedom, in the grace. Stand, therefore, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Who's he talking to? He's talking to believers. And he's saying there at the outset of this chapter, stand fast in what Christ has done. Stand in the freedom, stand in the liberty and don't be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. The law, the law says do and be blessed. True? Disobey and be cursed. Okay. Obey and be blessed, disobey and be cursed. What does grace say? Believe and be blessed. Is that not true? Do and be blessed is a summary of the law. Grace says Christ has done everything, fulfilled everything. Believe and you will be blessed. Now, as believers, we do. Okay? That's the cart that is drawn by the horse, not the horse that draws the cart. What a difference. The law. What is the essence of the law? What did Jesus teach? You know, what is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God, isn't it? With all your heart, your mind, your soul, and strength. Second, love your neighbour like it. All right? So if you were to sum up, according to what Jesus said in answering that question, 
What is the law? How would you summarise it? Well, you could say love God and love people. Would that be a fair summary of what the law teaches? Does that get people saved? There's a lot of loving people who love God and love people, but are they saved? No. That is the cart that the horse drags. Right? Loving God and loving people is the fruit of salvation, not the means of salvation. I hope you understand this. Galatians 2.16. Go back a little bit. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, loving God and loving people, you can just have that thought in your mind. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. He said it over and over in different ways, didn't he? When Paul is really trying to argue something, he says it, then he says it backwards, and he says it again, and he make, make sure you get, you get it. Loving God and loving people doesn't get people to heaven. Trusting the Lord Jesus Christ does. Believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work upon Calvary does. Loving God and loving people is not the gospel. Do you realise that? The gospel is Jesus, Son of God, left heaven, lived a perfect life, died on a cross as a substitute for the sin of the world, laid down his life for you and for me that we may have our sins forgiven by trusting in what he did. Is that not it? That he was died, he buried and he rose again. That's the gospel. Loving God and loving people is the fruit that happens when people receive Christ by faith. That's the cart, not the horse. That's, and I could say it this way, it's, it's a law concept. Do good and be blessed. Not a faith concept. That's why Paul in Galatians 2 verse 10 says this, 2 verse 20 he says this, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Christ lives in me. The power at work in me is, is Christ. He sent another comforter, another of the same kind, the Holy Spirit that would come and reside in me and empower me. The power in me is God working from within and how do we live this life which bears fruit? And I was teaching the teenagers this this morning. How do we as Christians love God and love people? It's by bearing the fruit of the Spirit which comes as we abide in Him. Verse 21 says, Paul, after saying that Christ is in me and it's His power and the life I live, I, you know, I live in the flesh by faith. There is a wonderful depth in the concept of the just shall live by faith. There is a depth of understanding that I am only scratching the surface of as a believer. The just shall live by faith. But here he says in verse 21, I do not frustrate the grace of God. This is Paul as a believer saying, the power in me that makes me in the flesh work and live the way I ought to live is the power of God in me. He says, I don't frustrate the grace of God for if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. If I can love God and love people and be right with God by my own strength, then Christ didn't need to to die. It is possible to frustrate the grace of God when it comes to being justified. Right? People can try and earn their way to heaven and ignore what Christ has done on the cross and frustrate God's, God's message of grace and say, no, I'm going to thwart that, I'm going to hinder that. I want nothing to do with salvation by faith in Christ. But you know, you can thwart, you can, what's the word he says here, frustrate, you can frustrate the grace of God in sanctification too. That is, you can try to be saved by faith and made perfect by your own fleshly works. And I feel that this is a danger to our conservative churches more than we realise. Much more than we realise. We trust Christ and then because we are independent Baptists with a capital I, we need to live a particular way in order to demonstrate our salvation. Well, I believe we're frustrating the grace of God in sanctification because we are making it a works issue rather than a resting and trusting issue. And we do it here. Don't think I'm preaching to another crowd. I'm preaching to Springwood, all right? We do it here where we start ticking boxes and checking boxes and thinking we're spiritual. 
and it's in the power of the flesh, not in the grace of God at work in us, not Christ living in me, but me striving. Verse, chapter 3, verse 1. I'm going to get us back to Galatians 5, I promise you this. Galatians 3, verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. He says, didn't I preach the gospel? Didn't I preach Christ before you? Didn't I set him as the sacrifice for sin, the perfect and complete sacrifice for sin before you? You, you received this, you understood this. I should be careful saying receive because some people will disagree with me there. Christ was proclaimed, set forth, crucified among you. Then he asked the question, this only would I learn of you. Received you the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. He's saying, how did you get saved? By doing good to men and loving God and doing good? By a law principle at work where you strive and you, I'm going to obey and I'm going to be blessed? Or is it faith? And the obvious answer, it's a rhetorical question. They don't even need to go, oh, Paul, I don't know. Like they know the answer. They got saved if they are saved by faith, didn't they? It's the only way. Verse 3, are you so foolish? What? Having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? See, that's a, that's a rebuke to a legalistic Christian right there. Saved by faith, mature by works, by the flesh. It doesn't work. It creates self-righteousness, but not Christ-like righteousness. Because unless it's the Holy Spirit doing it in us, guess what? It's not fruit that brings glory to him. It's an outward conformity that appears good before men, and we pat ourselves on the back for it. It's a self-righteous fruit. That verse, verse 3, is a rebuke to legalistic Christians. Have you begun in the Spirit? Are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Verse 4, have you suffered so many things in vain, if it yet be in vain? And he goes on and explains it more to them. Verse 3 and 4, I'll read it. No, we just have um, hearing of faith, saved by faith in Christ. What is legalism? They were saved, but they were tempted to be shifting across into a, an embracing of legalistic bondage. What is legalism? Legalism is a mental attitude and a false belief that seeks to merit salvation, eternal security, or even sanctification by one's works or rituals. It can be true of someone trying to be justified before God. It can be true of someone who's trying to be sanctified before God as a Christian. Well, I say that because you turn to Galatians 5 and you see the same argument here. He's just given an argument to believers in chapter 3 saying, you've begun in the spirit, are you now are you making this, this, the foolish mistake of trying to do it in your own strength? And then in verse five, chapter 5, verse 1, he says, stand fast, therefore, hold on to the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Don't go back into to legalistic effort, fleshly effort. Have a look at verse 2. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. What does he mean? What is he talking about circumcision for? Why this? Well, circumcision was the first step of obedience for a baby, wasn't it? I don't know. Parents would have a male child on the eighth day. This is for the, the nation of Israel. They would circumcise that baby boy as a, as a sign and a seal into a, a two-party contract covenant between that individual and God himself. And it's a way of saying, I will obey. I will submit to the law. I will follow the instructions in your word. I will be part of God's, God's nation, God's people, and I will walk in obedience to what you have established for us, and I will embrace the blessings, and I will embrace the cursings. That's what circumcision is. It's an acceptance of the law. Paul is saying, you don't go back to that. If you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. If you go back to obey and be blessed and disobey and be cursed... What is the point of Christ? It's a serious question. Like, I'm, I'm, that is a serious question. If you go back to that, what is the point of Christ? Is he a ticket to heaven? The end of your life? Because you're going to be the best Christian you can be in the power of the... Like, I'm going to get God to bless me by walking in obedience. Now, I'm not against obeying God, believe me. But I am against obeying God and thinking that that's somehow going to make me more accepted in him because we are perfectly accepted in Jesus Christ. And that is a concept these people who deny eternal security miss. 
They think that they need to be righteous to be accepted, but guess what? As a believer, you already are. They don't get that. And they get all caught up striving and straining and trying and frustrated in their life because they don't have what they think they ought to have. And the demands of the Scriptures are oh so high. Oh, we need to be this, we need to do this, we need to do, we need to be, we need to obey. And they get the cart before the horse. What happens if you put a cart before a horse? Where does that cart go? Nowhere. What, is the, what happens to the horse? It gets tangled up and breaks a leg. All right? Grace draws good works. It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Verse 3. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. If you, if you start embracing this two-party contract with God, obey and be blessed, disobey and be cursed, oh man, that's like you've got two sides of the ledger and God's on one side and you're on the other and what do you do with your side of the ledger? Do you mess it up like I do? I mean, if you are living on a, on a basis of obey and be blessed and disobey and be cursed, how much obeying are you doing? Like... Your side of the ledger looks a mess if you're anything like me. But it's not just bits of the law that you want. If you embrace this principle, the, old, the, the law principle, which parts do you choose? Well, you've got to keep the Sabbath. What about animal sacrifice? Did any of you do chores yesterday on your, your Sabbath day? Anyone mow the lawns? Anyone take out the bins? Anyone wash the pots? I don't know, I don't know whatever the, the other laws they had. Anyone pull their cow out of a ditch? I don't know, but all of these things you're not supposed to do on a Sabbath. Oh, if you want to keep the law, which parts? Taking animals to the temple? Which temple? Which priests? Which do you choose? But the Bible says here, if you go this way, he's a debtor to do the whole law. Verse 4, Christ has become of no effect to you. Whosoever of you are, are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. I have a question for you. Who is justified by the law? Will we agree no one? There's none that have been justified by the law. The Bible has told us so many times that that's the case. So when it says this in verse 4, Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, we need to add the understanding to that, whosoever of you are, who are trying to be justified by the law. And some translations add that, all right, because it, it's the only way that it makes sense. Christ has become of no effect to you, whosoever of you are trying or attempting to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. All right, let's have a look at the content. Who is he writing to? That's the context. That's a fairly broad one. We've worked our way right through Galatians. But who's he writing to? Believers or unbelievers? Believers. Galatians 3.26, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Verse, chapter 4, verse 6, God has sent forth his spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Galatians 4.5, Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever you are justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. You say, is that believers or unbelievers? I believe it's talking to believers still. What does it mean for Christ to be of no effect unto you? Now, this is interesting. And some, some translations, and I'll go with this, I hate doing this because my utmost confidence is in the King James. But I will say, I look at this and I go, okay. The Greek means this. It means to, be, to, to render idle, literally or figuratively, to abolish, to cease, to do away with, to make of no effect, which is what we've got translated here, to fail or to loose, to bring to naught, to put away, to vanish away or make void. So I go, okay. It's not used in many other places. Well, it is used in different ways in other places in the Scriptures. But the, the New King James, and I know I'm going to get comments after, because I'm opening a can of worms here, all right, but they translate this as estranged, all right? that Christ has become estranged to you. Now, we don't use that phrase very often, but you might think of a married couple who are estranged. What does that mean for that married couple? They're still married. They're not divorced, all right? But they are separate, all right? There's a great distance between the two. There's, there's no intimacy. There's no closeness. And, you know, there, there's, there's no fellowship. It's alienation and distance, and when we read of no effect, Christ being of no effect, it, it carries that idea right, where he's no longer, we're no longer in that closeness. We're no longer fellowshipping. And that's what happens when you go down a legalistic path. 
you become distant to the Lord because he operates on the basis of grace, not on the basis of us trying to merit his blessings. When you shift from a grace principle into a law principle, you are entering again into bondage. That's Galatians 5.1, all right? Stand in the liberty where with Christ has made you free. Don't be entangled again in the yoke of bondage. Then he starts talking about circumcision and the whole law and just the, the bondage that the law creates. And then in verse 4, he says, if you try to be justified, to be right with God by, by the law, you, you fall from grace. You fall from the grace principle. All right. Now I'll say this. The moment you put your faith in Christ, you're part of the family of God. And I believe that can never be lost, but the fellowship can be broken. I've been saying this through this series often. And you say you can lose fellowship by sin, can't you? All right. If a Christian sins, he puts a barrier willfully that, that between him and God, and God calls us to confess and repent of our sin. All right. First John 1 John 1.9 tells us to confess our sin and he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin. So sin creates a barrier and separation and broken fellowship. But you know what else creates broken fellowship with God? Legalism. I said, really? Oh, the trap of Christian legalism is that it feels, it doesn't feel like legalism to the person who's living it. It actually feels like godliness. They look at themselves in the mirror and say, and I'm a godly Christian. I've got all this together. But the reality is that they are striving in the flesh and that breaks Christian fellowship with Christ. It opposes the grace principle and it becomes a legal principle at work. It's not, by the way, this warning here about those who fall from grace, is it sin that's the issue? Is it like people who are out committing adultery and who are out, you know, laying up all of the, drinking in the, the, the full cup of the world's poison. Is, it, is that the kind of person that he's warning that you're going to fall from grace? No. He's warning against those who might add to legalistic works and bring themselves back into bondage to the law. They're the really righteous people that he's warning. So if you say, oh, brother, you better not sin like that, you'll fall from grace, that is completely wrong. I can tell you legalistic Christians, you better start trusting wholly in the grace of God, not yourself, or else you'll fall from grace. And that is right. You say, what? What does it mean to fall from grace? That doesn't mean they fall from salvation. That's not what it says. It doesn't say that. It's saying that when they seek to be justified by a principle of law, they fail the principle of grace. They miss what Christ is doing. And a believer can fall from that principle and fall into legalism. Can a believer fall from grace? Yes. Can they fall out of grace? Do you believe you as a Christian can fall out of God's grace? It's a bit like saying if you're, help, if you're kept in the palm of, of Christ's hands and then the Father's hands, can you fall over in his hand? Yeah, I did yesterday. You fall in sin, and you, but you don't fall out of his hand. All right? You don't sin and go plunk on the floor and go, whoops, that's not what God does. But be believer, you stumble and fall. Yes? but you're not discarded from the hands of God. All right? You're safe there. And much the same way, you can fall from the principle of grace whilst you're kept in the Father's hands, but you don't fall out of his hands. You don't fall out of salvation. The Trinity are involved in keeping, saving you and keeping you saved. Now, I, I hope you get that context, all right? that this is not so much about the down and outers, it's for those that are trying, you know, wearing the tie, all right? The ones who look good on the outside, who are justifying themselves or appearing like they're righteous. This is the one he's warning. And then we read through, uh, let's just read verse 5. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Verse 6, for in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love you did run well, who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? You see that, that warning? You, you, you started well, but who led you astray? Now, that's talking about people who are getting caught up with the law, isn't it? Right? Good pe People are doing good works in their flesh. And then in verse 8, 
He talks about those who are doing this subverting. This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. So this, this confusion is not coming from God. Verse 9, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Oh, we love to use that about a little bit of sin in your life is going to make you really bad sin. But in the context, it's just saying a little bit of legalism leads to more legalism. You understand? I hope you do. All right? He's saying this little bit, of, and it's true the other way. All right? it's, a, it's a truism that a little bit of leaven does leaven the whole lump. But in this context, he's saying about these false teachers that were leading them into the bondage to legalism again. Verse 8, verse 9, verse 10. Verse 10, For I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment whosoever he be. See, Paul's just, he's out of the false teachers. He said, they're leading you astray. You started well, you ran well. Who hindered you that you should not, not obey the truth? Just a little bit of this is going to ruin all of this. And then in verse, where are we? Verse 11. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offence of the cross ceased. I would that they were even cut off, which trouble you. So he's talking about these false teachers. And then in verse 13, we kind of see a, a change of, of emphasis. He's been talking about legalistic effort. And then in verse 13, he says this, For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. See, we're back here again. Verse 1 says the same thing. Stand fast in the liberty. Don't be dragged back into bondage. Verse 13, For brethren, you have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. You see now he's changing what he's talking about? The early part of the chapter, he's warning them against getting caught up in legalistic self-effort. And then when I preach this, people say, oh, you're going to lead Christians to sin. They're going to live like the devil. What does Paul say here? Because he kind of counters that. He says, don't use this liberty as an occasion for the flesh, verse 13. But by love serve one another. He says, no, you're free in Christ. And he warns them, don't get caught up in works. Then he says, don't get caught up in licentiousness and sin. He's got these two extremes and he's warning them about both of them. Let's move through because <laughs> this is... I don't have time for all of this today and I appreciate your patience for as much as we can get done. All right? I really do. What he leads into is a passage that I have been presented with in the last six months about six or eight times by different people trying to argue that you can lose your salvation. Okay? So as soon as I've started preaching this, I've had people come and say, but what about, but what about, but what about? This is why I'm doing what I'm doing. And even last week I had someone telling me about this verse. But what about Galatians 5.19? But what about 1 Corinthians 6? But what about Ephesians 5? But what about Revelation 20? And it just goes on and I'm trying to answer them all as best as I can systematically. And I'm not going to have time to do all of them, but I'm going to bundle four together now. Have a look down at what, what I'm talking about so you know where I'm going. Verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? Verse 19. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you, to have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And I've been told, well, if you commit adultery, you're going to go to hell. Christian, if you commit adultery, you're going to hell. Christian, and then I go, but what about the hatred part? What about the envyings? What about, the, what about wrath? What about variance? What about all these other sins that are listed here? They just pick on adultery because they can point it out. So they use this passage and say, well, if you do these things, you won't inherit the kingdom of God. And people go, oh, man, I've done some of those things. And that causes great fear. There are four passages in the Scriptures which have this warning. Right? And they're actually called the household codes. And I don't really know why they're called the household codes. It, it's because this is the way that the household of God should not live. All right? This is the code that we ought not be governed by. I think that's where it's coming from. But there's four of them. All right? and, and I won't turn to all of them today. We might be able to look at Galatians here and 1 Corinthians 6. And I, I would like to try and give you the answer. All right? Because what's true here is also true of why Paul uses it in 1 Corinthians and in Ephesians Revelation's a little bit different, but we don't have time to get there. So what does it mean to fall from grace? Well, I believe it's falling from a grace principle and striving in the flesh to try and be right before God. 
You can do that as a lost person, but you can also do that as a Christian. Here, he's warning now against using the liberty we have as Christians as an occasion for the flesh, just to live the way we please. So he's changed his emphasis. And as we work our way through, we'll see this. Now, I've talked about lenses before, haven't I? When you come to the Scriptures, you need to recognise the lens by which you understand what you're reading. I've explained to you about a Calvinistic lens or an Arminian lens, all right? I'm also going to share with you what it is like a hyper, a really extreme free grace position as well, which we need to avoid. And then I'll try and bring back some clarity as well. But let's just say you're a Calvinist and you read these verses. And if you are a Calvinist and you disagree with me, that's okay. But I'm trying to give the, just the broad idea of this is what Calvinism teaches and how most Calvinists interpret this passage. They read it and go, okay, there's a long list of, of things, works of the flesh, all of these sins, and the people who live this way don't go to heaven. So therefore, these are people who th either think they're saved or they're part of a church, but they're living in sin, so therefore they are not elect. Okay? Their works expose their lack of spiritual life. Okay? So this warning here, you go through saying we need to walk in the spirit, not fill the lust of the flesh, and then they say that there's, there's a very real possibility that there are people in the church who are not saved, and the way you know that is because they're living like this. Now, that's partly reasonable because if people are living like this, it's pretty much it's an evidence that they, they may not be saved. But guess what? What if a Christian commits adultery? So the Calvinist goes, well, he was never saved. Okay? Or if he lives in habitual sin or he dies in sin, and the doctrine that they hold to is the perseverance of the saints. So if they continue in sin through the days of their life and they end in sin, then that's, that's it. That's an evidence that they were never, never saved. That's the, the Calvinistic lens and it creates a worry in the minds of some because they, and I know one fella down in Bendigo who's convinced that he can't be saved and he's not one of the elect because he lives in sin. If he trusts the Lord, he'll be delivered from sin and he'll be free. But, so that's the Calvinistic lens. What about the Arminian one? The Arminians believe that you can lose your salvation so they read this verse and they go, well, if I do these things, then I'll lose what I've got. So it's a list of, of warnings about, well, if you commit adultery, if you commit fornication, if you commit lasciviousness, if you do these things, then you won't inherit the kingdom of God. And some will argue to it, they'll say, well, what about the, if you die in unrepentant sin in these sins at the end of your life, then you'll go to hell. So every day you're walking going, Am I, have I sinned, have I not sinned, have I sinned, have I not sinned? What sins are forgiven? We've talked about it a lot through this series. So that's the Arminian lens. They read this and go, if I, as a believer, do these things, I go to hell. That's Arminian doctrine. I'll give you a, a hyper free grace doctrine. And I know I'm giving you a lot. A man by the name of Zane Hodges, who's passed away now, he held to this position. And it is that this is a warning for genuine believers. Now, this is his idea. That if we live in these ways and commit these sins, we will not inherit the kingdom of God in that we will be excluded from the millennium. Okay. So if we do these sins, if we commit adultery, you go to heaven, but you will be at the beam of seat judgment, cast into outer darkness where there's weeping, wailing and gnashing of teeth for a thousand years until the end of the millennial, and then you'll, you'll go to heaven and be with Christ. You haven't heard that before? It's making a comeback. We've, we've dealt with some of this. All right. It's a, an extreme free grace position. So they take all of these, these verses. Some go, oh, that's, that means that Christians are going to burn and go to hell. And they go, well, no, that can't be true because we don't believe Christians burn and go to hell. But it kind of sounds like they do. So let's say, well, maybe it's that they miss out on the rewards of a Christian and in doing so, they, they suffer for it. Do you believe the Bema Seat judgment of Christ is a judgment of punishment? They do. All right. They believe that that is a time where you'll be judged for your works and if, you, if you've behaved righteously, you'll go into the kingdom. If you've behaved sinfully, you'll go into outer darkness and you'll be like way, way, way back, way back. And where, you ask them, where is the outer darkness? And they go, I don't know. It's like a... What are we? We're Protestants, all right? Because we're not Catholics. Catholics believe in purgatory. This millennial exclusionism is like Protestant purgatory. If you haven't lived good enough, you've got to suffer a bit before you get to come into heaven. Is that that's what they're, where they're at? 
The reason I find that really hard is because the Bible says that there's no condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus. And, if, and the Bema Seat judgment is not one of punishment, it's one of reward or lack thereof. Right. So I re- reject that, that doctrine. And then there is a position which I do hold to. And I believe Paul switches subjects. And he's talking to believers and warning them to, to not give over not use their liberty which they have in Christ as an occasion for the flesh, what does that look like? Well, the works of the flesh are these. And he gives a list of what it would look like for a Christian to give themselves over to those things. And he says, and they that do those things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul is is teaching believers by saying, lost people live this way and they go to hell. You have liberty in Jesus Christ and you ought not live the way they live. That is the argument and it is as simple as that. It's nothing nothing more. He's talking to believers, clearly. Verse 16, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Who walks in the spirit? Only believers can, all right? He's talking to believers. Verse 18, but if you be led of the spirit, you're not under the law. So you're not under that bondage anymore. Then he goes on and say, don't walk this way. Verse 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest which are these. I'm not going to read the list again. But at the end of it he says, and such like, of the which I tell you before and have also told you in time past, that they, he says, you walk in the spirit, not fulfill the lust of the flesh, but they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. He has a very clear opportunity to say, if you do these things, you'll go to hell but he doesn't say that. He makes a very clear distinction between you and they, okay? And he does it on purpose. Turn over to 1 Corinthians 6 because we've got time to do this one. First Corinthians 6 verse 9. From you to they... 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, covetous, drunkards, nor uh, revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our, our God. It's pretty clear when you read it without trying to twist the doctrine here. But let's go back up. Verse 9, know ye not that the unrighteous. He's talking to believers. What kind of church was Corinth? Carnal church, we would say, and some people argue that there's no such thing as a carnal Christian. I've been up against that this last couple of months as well. Young, yeah, there's immature, there's new babes in Christ. You've got carnal Christians as well. And the church is full of problems. Is Paul not addressing them? Chapter 5, what's he dealing with? Some kind of incest in the church that's not even named among the Gentiles. What is it doing in the house of God? This is what Paul says. So why are you allowing this to happen? This doesn't fit our identity. This doesn't fit who we are. This, isn't, this doesn't even belong in the Gentiles. That's chapter 5. And he says in the beginning of chapter 6, why are you taking each other to court? Why can you not sort things out? Can you not find someone in the church to rule over your issue? But no, you've got to go to the courts, got to go to the the judges. You've got to take your disputes from within the church out before an unbeliever, an unjust judge, and get him to pass verdict. Paul says, what are you doing? Look at verse 1. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust? Same word translated unrighteousness in verse 9. Very important. Dare you to take this matter before the unjust and not before the saints. Unrighteous, saints. There's already a distinction in the first verse of our chapter. Verse 2. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world and if the world be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Why can't we figure this out, he says. Have a look further down. We won't read about judging angels. I I don't even want to try and explain that today. Um, Verse 4, 
If you then have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are the least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you, no, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren? But brother goeth the law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you, because ye go to law one with another. Why do ye not rather take wrong? Why do ye not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, ye do wrong and defraud, and that's your brethren. Don't you know, he says, don't you Christians know that the unrighteous, the unjust judge that you're going to, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. This is what he says. He's making a comparison between the behaviour of Christians and the behaviour of the world and saying, this doesn't fit your identity. He's not saying that, Christian, if you do this, then you go to hell. He's not saying, Christian, if you do this, then you miss out on the millennial kingdom. And he's not saying, person, if you do this, then you're not a Christian, even though you think you might be. He's saying that this is an example of how Christians ought not live. But we make it seem more than that, don't we? And look, we can conclude with these verses at the end. Because if you were wondering if he's actually speaking to Christians here and saying that they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God, in verse 11 he says, And such were some of you. But you're washed. But you're sanctified, but you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You used to live that way. You used to be an extortioner. You used to be an idolater. You used to be caught up with these things, but you're not now. To the praise and glory of our God. Jump down to verse 18. He says, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For you're bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. He kind of finishes out this chapter, bringing it back to the body. He says, don't use your body like an unbeliever uses their body. You're not your own, you're bought with a price. Therefore live accordingly. I hope that makes sense. We've talked about falling from grace and I believe that to be falling from a grace principle to a legalistic principle. That's my my understanding. We've also talked about what it is to not inherit the kingdom of God based on sin in these two passages, Galatians and 1 Corinthians 6. If you want, you can go to Ephesians 5 in your own time and even Revelation 22 and see if you can, using the same system of reading the context, carefully assessing the content, comparing with other scriptures, come to the right conclusion. You can spend your time do that. We won't come back at those verses in this series. But that's the way... To understand those four tricky passages. So what do we do? Do we fill our heads up and go, all right, that's interesting? Or do we go, I don't need to strive in order to be accepted by our God? And that's, a, that's the takeaway. I don't want you to be bound up in the yoke of bondage. I don't. Because it's not a joyful place. And you see people that are and they're miserable. I don't want you to be there. Paul warns against it. I want us to enjoy the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. But I don't want us to abuse that liberty and use it as an occasion for the flesh. That's what Paul talks about through Galatians 5. I hope that helps. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray today that you might fill our minds with truth and that you might allow that truth that we meditate upon to transform our lives. I pray that we might rest upon a foundation of security, um, for your word tells us that we are secure in him. Thank you for our, our safety. Thank you for the wonder of our salvation. And I pray that we might stand fast in that liberty and not use it for an occasion for the flesh. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.